Well, again, before we get to Mark 14, I'd like to just briefly survey the entire Gospel of Mark as it pertains to Christ's identity. You remember Mark writes his Gospel to us for a singular purpose, and that is to tell us who is Jesus. His opening words of his Gospel are, this is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the King of Israel. This is who he is. And all along the way, we have seen a suspenseful roller coaster. You see, as Mark opens, he tells us, he front loads to us, I'm going to tell you who Jesus is, he's the Christ. But that is from author to reader. The amazing thing about Mark's gospel is that the characters in the story don't know that. And Mark tracks with us about this, this roller coaster, this suspense of how people come to conclude that he's the Christ. And, and maybe the people who don't believe that he's the Christ, how do they respond when they find out publicly, as we will this morning, who he is? And because we've spent almost two years in Mark's gospel, maybe some of that suspense has been lost on us. But we come to a very suspenseful point in Mark's gospel, and that is Jesus telling the public who he is. He hasn't done that yet. He's told his disciples in secret, and they still don't get it. And he's, he's been acknowledged publicly as the Messiah, but he himself has been silent. And so let's just briefly survey the roller coaster of Mark of, of people coming to the conclusion that Jesus is the Christ. And so first of all, we leave aside Mark's opening words in chapter 1, verse 1. If you can track with me quickly, you might want to... Do you, what are, you have those, uh, those thimble things, what are those called that you use for sorting mail? Nola, what are those called? Rubber, thumb. rubber thumbs. If anybody's got a rubber thumb, you want to get that out. <laughs> the first thing we hear about Jesus in Mark's gospel is from John the Baptist. Setting aside the as it is written, John the Baptist come baptizing in the wilderness, and in verse 7, we have a, a prophet who has everyone's attention in Jerusalem and Judea, and he says this, someone greater than me is coming. So we don't know who Jesus is yet, but we know this. John was the greatest prophet who ever lived, and Jesus will be greater. That's the first thing we hear. We hear the Father tell the Son, you are my Son in whom I am well pleased. I'm not going to discuss that. I'm going to leave that aside. The second thing that we hear about Jesus is in chapter 1, he goes to Capernaum. He goes to the synagogue, and he's preaching, and people say, well, he teaches with authority. But then he casts out a demon. And the demon obeys him at a word. And people ask the question in chapter 1, verse 27, what is this? Is this a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. What's going on here? Who is this? Just a few verses later in chapter 2, Jesus heals a paralytic, but before he does that, he tells him, your sins are forgiven. And his enemies ask the question, who does this guy think he is? In chapter 2, verse 7, they says, well, This man blasphemes. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Who does this guy think he is with the authority to forgive sins? And then Jesus affirms, I do have the authority to forgive sins. It's very suspenseful. And then even as we continue, we come to chapter 3, verse 21, and his family, his family who knows him better than anyone else, they don't believe in him. They think he's nuts. They say he's out of his mind. We have to go seize him. And then after that, we hear about the religious authorities. In chapter 3, verses 22 through 30, they think he's possessed by Satan. Why, why do the demons obey him? Well, because he's their chieftain. He's their captain, so they have to obey him. And so his family, who knows him best, doesn't believe. And the, the religious authorities, they don't trust in him. Then we come to chapter 4, verse 41, and Jesus calms a storm. And again, his disciples ask the question, Who is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. So it's not just the supernatural that obeys him, it's also nature itself, obeying Jesus. Again, we come in chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, Jesus comes to his hometown to teach in the synagogue, and again, the people who know him best, they say, who is this? Isn't this the carpenter? Where did this man get these things? Where is this wisdom coming from and these miraculous powers? And again, the people who know him best don't believe. After that, we hear about public rumors. Jesus has been around long enough and enough people are interested in him in that in chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, we start to hear public rumors. Some think that he's John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Some think that he's a prophet like one of the prophets of old. Some think that he's Elijah. 
And those are just some of the suggestions. Are you picking up this dispense? Who is he? The demons obey him. He claims to forgive sins. The wind and the sea obey him. His family thinks he's nuts. The religious leaders don't trust him. What is going on here? It is a suspenseful question. Who in the world is Jesus of Nazareth? And then we change gears in chapter 8. Because Jesus has a private discussion with his disciples, and he says, well, who do you guys think that I am? And they say, well, you know, there's these public rumors about you that you might be John the Baptist or Elijah or, or, or someone else. But then Jesus says, but, but what do you think? Who do you think that I am? And, and Peter says, you're the Christ. So, so privately, secretly, they have come to the correct conclusion. He's the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the King of Israel come to set up the kingdom of God on earth. That's who he is. But here's the catch. They still don't understand. They, they, they've come to the conclusion about his job title, but they don't know about the job description because Jesus says, bingo, and I've come to lay down my life. I've come to be rejected by the leaders and to be killed and to rise after three days. And how do they respond? Peter says, no way. Nuh-uh. Not you. And so here's the suspense as it continues. Some people have come to that conclusion secretly, but even those who understand don't understand. So then they head to Jerusalem. Jesus says, now that you guys have figured that out, let's go to Jerusalem and I'm going to go die. And on the way to Jerusalem, here's, what, here's what's interesting is... We have a man named Bartimaeus sitting on the roadside in Jericho, right outside of Jerusalem. This is chapter 10, verses 47 and 48. And he hears that it's Jesus of Nazareth, and he says, he yells out over the crowd, Son of David. In other words, Messiah, Christ, have mercy on me. And so the suspense continues in that the disciples aren't the only ones who have come to the right conclusion. And it's not just a secret anymore. There's someone de declaring it publicly. Jesus is the Messiah. This is the guy. But Jesus doesn't say a word. He heals him, but he doesn't say, yes, publicly, you're right, I am. And then right after that, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 10, we have the triumphal entry where Jesus rides in on a colt, which is, which is a prophecy that people would have recognized. You have people throwing their coats and branches from trees and bushes in the road, which is, which is a royal reception. It was like the red carpet of the day. And you have people saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And, they, and people are getting it. They're starting to understand this looks like he's the guy, the Messiah. And yet... Jesus receives it, but doesn't say a word. And so up to this point, some people have come to the, the conclusion, some people have even acknowledged it publicly, but Jesus himself has not said a word to the public about his identity. So keep that roller coaster in mind as we read Mark 14, starting in verse 53. It says, They led Jesus to the high priest... And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting there with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and bore witness against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. Just by way of context, Remember that as we join Jesus, he's just been arrested. His disciples have just abandoned him, and you notice that Peter followed him at a distance. But, but we join him as he's led to an unjust midnight trial, where he's going to be unjustly condemned to death. 
And the point of our passage is this. Jesus did not deserve death for any wrongdoing on his own part. That there was no just immediate cause for Jesus to be tried, arrested, or sentenced to death. In fact, the immediate cause for his death was that sinful people needed him to get out of the way. He was threatening their livelihood, their authority, their influence, and they said, we've got to do something about this guy. And they've, they've come up with these conspiracies about how they can deal with him treacherously. And in the bigger picture, we remember that, that it's not just people treating Jesus as if he was guilty, it's God treating Jesus as if he was guilty. And, and why is that? It's not because Jesus was guilty, but because God was treating him as such so that he could pay the penalty for the guilty. You and I were the guilty ones. You and I were the ones that should have been on trial before God. And yet Jesus bore that guilt and paid that punishment so that the humble, the repentant, the guilty could go free. That's why Jesus is dying here in the big picture. But immediately, there is no cause. There is no guilt on his part in a human court for why he should have died. It's, it's wicked people getting him out of the way. So our outline this morning is going to try, I, I tried to put it together like a courtroom scene for you. We're going to have Mark set the scene for us in verses 53 and 54. There will be a prosecution, a defense, a judgment, and an execution. So we'll, we'll go through those. But first of all, Mark set the scene for us in verses 53 and 54. He tells us uh, where Jesus is, where the Sanhedrin are, and where Peter is. And so you read with me in verse 53. It says, They led Jesus to the high priest... And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. So, so where is Jesus? He's being led to trial. And who else is there? Well, his enemies. Do you remember the big three? The chief priests and the scribes and the elders? They're only mentioned together a few times in Mark's gospel, and this is the last time. This is the final encounter. This is it. I know we had the debate that we called the final showdown. That was the final public showdown. This is the final showdown. It's at midnight. It's just them. This is it. You notice who else is there? The high priest? The high priest is there. You catch the irony with that? You see, the high priest was supposed to be the, the shadow that anticipated Jesus. Jesus is the real, true high priest, according to the line of Melchizedek, not according to the line of Levi, as you read in Hebrews. And also, you just consider that he's the man that's supposed to go between God and man. And yet, what's he doing? He's condemning God to death. You consider that. Also, other people have, have shown that it's interesting enough that the high priest who normally condemned the sacrifices to death, the high priest who was normally one who oversaw the sacrifices, is the very one who is condemning Jesus, our innocent, perfect sacrifice for us. So people think that there's just some bigger picture subtleties going on that God is showing. You see, this is the real true sacrifice, even being condemned by the high priest. So this is it. They're there. We also hear about Peter in verse 54. Verse 54, it says, Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. We, we could spend a lot more time on Peter. We're not going to do that today. We'll talk about him next week in his denial. But, but for now, do you see that the stage is set? Jesus is on trial. His enemies are there. The high priest is there. And Peter is just outside. So if we're treating this like a, like a courtroom, because it kind of is, it's a kangaroo court, let's hear from the prosecution, starting in verse 55. You see, the plaintiffs will make their case against the defendant Jesus, except there, I, I, I'm, I'm treating this as if it's a just court. I'm saying the plaintiffs will make their case. The fact is they don't have a case. So the plaintiffs are going to make their case. You start in verse 55. It says, Now the chief priests... And the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus. We're seeking testimony against Jesus uh, to put him to death, but they found none. I want you to notice this, first of all, that they already have a sentence in mind. See that? They have a sentence in mind. They just don't have viable charges to get there. They, they have in mind that they need to put him to death. They just don't have any criminal charges. They have no reason for it. That's emphasized by Mark as you see that it says they were seeking testimony against Jesus. 
You notice also, it doesn't say that they sought charges. It says that they were seeking charges. It's, it's a repetition. And there are multiple verbs that are used here between were seeking, weren't finding, were testifying. On top of verse 56 saying many rose up and testified against him that communicate this was an ongoing process. This is something that went over and over and over multiple times. How about some charges over here? Nope, that's not going to work. How about over here? Nope, that's not going to work either. Probably frustrating for everybody involved, really. For Jesus, for his enemies, for the false witnesses. But you see, there's this ongoing process of them trying to grasp at straws, and yet there's nothing. Jesus was innocent. He kept God's law perfectly. He was the perfect, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John calls him in John 1. And there is no immediate cause for them to charge him. And so this trial is an absolute mockery of justice. What kind of charges did they come up with? Well, you read in verse 57. It says, Some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying... We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this, their testimony did not agree. This charge is really interesting, because Jesus said something like this, but he didn't say it in Mark. Do you remember that? This happened at the cleansing of the temple, not in Mark 11, but in John chapter 2. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will build it in three days. So he said something like it, but not exactly like it. They're actually misquoting him. You see here, they say he said, they say he said, you tracking with me? That's kind of tough to track with. They say that Jesus said this, I will destroy this temple and in three days build another not made with hands. That's not what Jesus said. When he cleansed the temple, they said, What sign do you give us to show us you have the authority to cleanse the temple? And he said, You destroy this temple. He doesn't say, I will. He says, You do it. it it's, a, it's a command. It's a condition. If you destroy this temple, I will rebuild it. So, first of all, they're misquoting him. Second of all, John told us in John 2, 21 and 22, that Jesus wasn't talking about the Jerusalem temple being destroyed and rebuilt. Rather, Jesus was talking about his own body being destroyed and rebuilt. But here's the kicker. John says, we didn't get that. Not until after Jesus raised himself from the dead, we didn't understand. And so they're misquoting him, and nobody understood it, and they're contradicting themselves. It says their testimony didn't agree. So these charges are simply not viable. And, and you think about it, from their perspective, they don't have the knowledge that we have. It probably sounds nonsensical. I'm going to destroy a gigantic temple that's taken 40 years to build, and in three days I'm going to build a temple not with my hands. What's he going to use? His feet? The force? So, so they don't have viable charges. They're contradicting themselves. They don't know what they're talking about. And the prosecution, settled on a sentence, cannot come up with a conviction. They just can't do it. Why? Because he was the innocent, spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What about the defense? Well, we read Jesus' defense, or lack thereof, in verses 60 through 62. It says, the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it these men testify against you? But he remained silent and gave no answer. Well, what answer does Jesus give to these garbage charges? Well, crickets. Nothing. I mean, what is there to say? Well, why would you answer to false and muddled charges? They're contradicting themselves. That's nonsense. You don't know what they're talking about. There's no reason for me to give an answer to these charges. They're just not, they don't hold water. There's nothing I can say to affirm or deny anything. It's a bunch of silliness. So he gives them silence. And the other fact is he's going to die anyway. No matter what he says to affirm or deny these silly charges, they have already chosen his fate. He's going to die. We're going to put him to death. We'll find something, but he's going to die. He has to. That's the way that this is going to go. And in the bigger picture, they're not the ones who decided his fate. He and his father are. In eternity past, the father and the son agreed, I'm going to go die unjustly, and I will do it to suffer for those who repent and put their trust in Jesus. 
And so we have, for example, in Isaiah 53, 7, saying that like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shears is silent, he opened not his mouth. That is, when, when the Messiah comes and he goes to his death, he won't be quarreling or crying aloud. He won't be fighting and saying, this is unjust. He will go silently. It says in Isaiah 53, 7, he'll go like a sheep before its shears. That is, when you shear, you give sheep a haircut. I'm very thankful that the sheets have allowed me to go to their place to observe their sheep being shorn. Is that the right? Is that the participle or the... the I've been there to watch them shear their sheep. By the way, when Callie and I first got here, and I was trying to remember everybody's names, I remembered Sharon and Don because I would say, Sharon Sheets shears her sheep. Can you say that five times fast? But they invited me over to see their sheep get shorn. That's right, Sharon, okay. And it was, it was kind of humorous because the shearer, he grabs the bottom of their jaw and kind of like puts them in a headlock and holds them down. And they struggle at first, but then they just go lame. They go dumb. And people think it's because they've been through the process over and over and they think, okay, I've been through this before. I'm not going to get hurt. I'm fine. And so sheep, before their shears, are dumb. They're silent. They're, they're lame. They don't do anything. They just let it happen. And that is what's happening here. Isaiah says Jesus will come and be silent like a sheep before its shears. And here is Jesus on trial, and he is silent before his accusers. Now, I want you to consider another level of Jesus' silence. You consider this. In Mark, what have we seen? We have seen the power of of Christ's words over and over and over. There is power in the words of Jesus. Amen? We have seen throughout Mark's gospel that demons obey him. They have to. We have seen that the sea obeys him. So both the supernatural and nature obey the words of Christ. We have seen him with his words open the eyes of the blind, open the ears of the dead, or open the ears of the deaf, and even raise people from the dead with the word. Because there is power in the words of Christ. We have seen him in public debate. And when Jesus answers people with his words in debate, people are dumbfounded and muzzled. They have nothing they can say to respond to Jesus. There's an episode in John's Gospel when some people are sent to arrest Jesus. And they come back empty-handed and the people say, where's Jesus? And they say, no one ever spoke like that man. We couldn't arrest him. There's nothing we could do. We saw in the Garden of Gethsemane in John that they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I'm him. And they all fell down on their faces. There's power in the words of Jesus. And throughout the rest of the Bible, what do we hear? We hear that the universe itself, everything that we know, everything that we've ever seen, was born by the words of Christ. We hear in Hebrews chapter 1, that everything is held together by the word of his power because there is power in the words of Christ. And so here, at his trial, you consider what he could have done with his words. He could have dumbfounded his accusers and walked free from the courtroom. He could have marched to Jerusalem or to Rome and, and, and established his kingdom. He could command legions of angels. He could slay everyone in the room or everyone on the planet. And yet, he is silent. What do you have to say about these charges? Nothing. You remember that we were born by the word of Christ. He created us with his words. And yet we are saved by his silence. And as we move forward, we hear more charges brought before him. Verse 61 continues. It says that the high priest asked him again, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now again, if you're familiar with Mark, that should sound familiar. Those are the opening words of Mark's gospel. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He calls him the blessed. That's just a roundabout way of speaking of God without using his name. Pretty common thing. In fact, Jesus does it when he says right at the right hand of power. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? So now Mark is telling us, You've seen this roller coaster of people having rumors about him, people not understanding him, people not believing in him, some people believing him but with a partial understanding, some people proclaiming who he is publicly. But finally, the question is posed to Jesus publicly, who do you think you are? And at this point in Mark's gospel, his characters and his story come to the conclusion that Mark front-loaded to us in his first words. 
Or at least they hear that conclusion, whether or not they agree with it. And so the, the high priest says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And now you read verse 62. What does Jesus say? I am. I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. So publicly, there's no more confusion about who Jesus thinks he is. Why? Does, who does he think he is forgiving sins? Why do demons obey him? Why does the sea obey him? Why does his family think he's nuts? Why is he possessed? Who does Jesus think about? What does he think about himself? Who does he think that he is? And now there is no more confusion. He says, I am. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the King of Israel. I am the Son of God. No more confusion. You notice he doesn't stop there? He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. You know what he just did there? He just quoted from two Old Testament passages. The first one is Psalm 110, and the second one is Daniel chapter 7. And here's the interesting thing about both of those passages. They are messianic prophecies, and they say that God will rule everything in the Messiah. The Messiah is God's king set up on the earth. It says that everyone is going to, God is going to give him everything, and everything will subsequently bow before him as Lord. They will worship him. And so Jesus is saying boldly, you all are going to bow the knee before me and worship. Not only that, those passages speak about the Messiah judging all of creation and God having his back. And so the Messiah will be the one who will judge every human being who has ever lived. That's the point of Psalm 110. That's the point of Daniel 7. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. Yeah, I'm the defendant right now in your kangaroo court. But on the last day, I will be the judge of everything, including you. And you will answer for this silly little midnight trial. And you'll answer for everything else that you've ever done. And so what is Jesus' defense? Well, concerning their false testimony, he has no silence. But if you're going to charge him with being king, then yeah, he's guilty as charged. And, and right now, for him, that's not great news because he's about to go suffer under God's wrath. But it's worse news for his oppressors because they will one day face him as those who killed him. And so yeah, I'm the defendant now. But I will be the judge on the last day and you'll be standing before me in judgment. You will be the defendant, and but guess what? You will be guilty. That's, that's a reminder for all of us here in this room that one day we will stand before him in judgment. We will. And we will answer for every wrong thing that we have ever done. And we have a chance now to place our faith in him. Jesus, you died to pay for my guilt. I am guilty, I am deserving of your wrath, and yet you paid that penalty, and I trust in you alone to forgive me and to save me. And if we do that, when we stand before him in judgment, we will be considered innocent because of his innocence that we see here. And so don't spurn your opportunity now. We are guilty, and we can receive his innocence and his payment for our penalty if we will trust in him and do it now because we don't know when judgment day is coming. We don't know when we will die. And he says, you will see me as the judge. Our, our situations are going to be flipped. So he tells his defendants, or he, he tells his prosecutors, yes, I'm the Christ, and that's bad news for you. And so the prosecution, we've heard from both them and the defense, he has refused the faulty charges, he has admitted, he has admitted to being the Messiah, and now we move forward to the judgment. The judgment is, in light of the evidence, what is the court's decision regarding guilt and the corresponding punishment? Well, we read in verse 63. It says in verse 63, the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? Now, you might have this question in your mind. A lot of people do. Was it really a crime to consider yourself the Messiah? Is, is there a law in the Old Testament or in the Jewish laws at this time that said, if you consider yourself the Messiah, you will be found guilty, deserving of death? And the answer is no. 
it was not a crime to consider yourself the Messiah. In fact, in other circumstances, they probably just would have laughed you out of the room. Ha ha, very funny, get out of here. So why is it different in Jesus' case? Because even though this isn't enough to incriminate him, this is enough to make the Romans nervous. Because first of all, Jesus has the blood of David flowing through his veins. He has a legitimate claim to the throne in Jerusalem. He is a descendant of David. He is the descendant of David. On top of that, he has hundreds, if not thousands, of followers. And so this is enough to get him before Rome and say, this is a revolutionary. He says that he's the king, and he's got a following. And Rome, as far as they're concerned, they're perfectly content with Herod as king. They've had a pretty good relationship with him so far, and, and they don't really want to deal with any, uh, any, any soap operas regarding the throne. And so is this a crime? No, but it's enough to make Rome nervous. This is what got them before Pilate, is these revolutionary charges. You'll also notice that the high priest accuses him of blasphemy. Did you catch that? You have heard his blasphemy. And did you also catch the irony there? That here is the high priest who is, condem excuse me, who is condemning God. He's getting ready to spit on God. And now he's accusing God of slandering God. There's some irony going on here. Then he asks the court in verse 64, What is your decision? What's your decision? And the fact is, this decision was made before we got here. This decision was the, the conclusion of their conspiracy at the beginning of chapter 14. Remember in chapter 14, in the very first or the second verse, it says that they were seeking a way to destroy him by stealth. You know that they had actually made that decision a long time ago. They made the decision back in chapter 3, if you were here with us back then. In chapter 3, verse 6, it says that he healed a withered man's hand on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees and the Herodians went out and counseled against him how they could destroy him. They've wanted to destroy him for years. You take it back even further than that, and Herod the Great tried to kill him as a baby. You go back even further than that, and we see throughout the Old Testament Satan trying to take out the line of David and even the whole nation of Israel. But the fact is, the decision was made before the universe was made. Again, God, in His wisdom, in His grace, decided before anything was made that He would glorify Himself by becoming a man and suffering on behalf of the guilty. So, what is your decision? Well, it's not really their decision. But it says they all condemned Him as deserving of death. And in the immediate context, the author of life is being condemned to death. And the only innocent man in the room, the only innocent man who ever lived, is being condemned as guilty. And this is the tragic and yet beautiful paradox of the gospel. It is what many people call the great exchange. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. And so what is the judgment? Well, in light of the evidence, the kangaroo court confirms their preconceived decision. The guilty, are con they condemn the innocent. The dead decide to kill the author of life. So lastly, what's the execution? Not the execution of his life, but the execution of their decision. Now that they have made this decision, how will they treat Jesus? How will they carry things out? Well, you read verse 65. And it says, Some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. You'll notice it says they began to spit on him. You consider that here are the dignified hoi polloi. Here are the, the scribes and the high priests, and Jesus says they like to walk around in long robes. They enjoy greetings in the marketplaces. They are the dignified folks of society. They are the cream of the crop, the aristocracy, and yet they sink to dishonor him in the most vile way they can. They spit on him. I think another funny detail about this is that we've heard about people spitting in Mark's gospel so far. Remember Jesus spit on a blind man and opened his eyes? Jesus spit on a deaf man and opened his ears? And yet here they are spitting on Jesus to dishonor him, to berate him, to slander him. You notice also they cover his face and they strike him. 
They blindfolded him, and they slapped him, and punched him, and hit him. Now we're going to change gears for a second. We're going to have a little bit of time in confession. Who here has been in a fist fight? Oh, Nick, how dare you? <laughs> how about this? Who's been sucker punched? You guys know what being sucker punched means? It means you get hit and you don't know that it's coming. I have a silly story to tell you. So when I was in high school, I used to box and I used to wrestle. So if you didn't know this already, I've been hit a time or two. And you're like, yeah, we kind of figured that. <laughs> but when I was a senior in high school, I wanted a black eye for my senior photo. <laughs> And so I went to my brother and I said, Howard, would you mind giving me a black eye for my senior photo? And you can imagine that my older brother was eager to lend his services. And so if anybody here wants a black eye, I know a guy. He's cheap. And so what I did was I just closed my eyes and I held my hands behind my back and I just stood there like this and all my brother did was jab me. He didn't throw a hook, an overhand, an uppercut, haymaker, anything. He just jabbed me. The lightest punch you can throw. And regardless of the fact that the impact on my eye wasn't that hard, because I had my eyes closed and because I wasn't ready for it, the impact, the whiplash, the shock, getting sucker punched is terrible. It's, it's awful. And even if someone doesn't hit you very hard, the mere fact that you're not ready for it is just overwhelming. And people get knocked out all the time from getting sucker punched. And so if you're curious, the first punch didn't do the trick. And so I had to, the next few times I held my hands like this so that, you know, I was braced up and, and so it still hurt, but there wasn't the whiplash and stuff. Okay. Silliness aside, should we take a breather here? <laughs> I asked Callie, should I tell this story? It's quite a bit of different tone than the rest of the sermon. <laughs> Silliness aside, I want you to consider this. Jesus is blindfolded, and he's getting slapped and mocked and punched. Being sucker punched is incredibly traumatizing. And he was hit probably in both the body and the head. And you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if Jesus got knocked out multiple times this night. Now, many of you have seen people get knocked out. If you watch a boxing match or if you watch the UFC, you see people get knocked out and it's like, oh, that was crazy. But if you see someone get knocked out in real life, whether it's in a street fight or at school or whatever, it's kind of scary. And you know what? I, I used to work for the Idaho Athletic Commission and I used to get to watch fights up close. And even though you know that knockouts are coming, they are still scary to watch because people get hurt. And, and, and you consider this, Jesus probably got knocked out multiple times that night. He probably even suffered from a concussion. So not only is he being unjustly condemned, but he's being unjustly brutalized. And this is just the beginning. We're going to go through what it means to have your scalp pierced and to be scourged and to be crucified. This is just the beginning. And yet I think sometimes we miss the horror of what Jesus went through simply because he wanted to take our punishment. You consider this also. There's another bit of irony. It says in verse 65, they were saying to him, prophesy. Hey, you would-be prophet. Tell us who's hitting you. Tell us what's going to happen next. And yet as they're speaking, they're fulfilling his prophecy. He said, I'm going to be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. That's already happened. They're going to condemn me to death. That's already happened. They're going, to, uh, they're going to spit on me and flog me. That's happening. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles. That's happening. So they're saying, prophesy, and his prophecies are coming to fruition. He said, my disciples are going to abandon me. That happened. Peter's going to deny me. That's getting ready to happen. And so there's this dramatic irony. Prophesy, pal. And he already has. They just weren't there to hear it. And so the innocent Jesus was found guilty and treated as such. And we look at the tragedy and yet the beauty and the paradox of the gospel. And again, we ask, why? It's funny, I think it was Chuck Smith that said, people ask, why do bad things happen to good people? And he said, that only ever happened once. Jesus was the only good person that ever suffered anything bad. And we ask, why? 
And, and you remember, this comes back to chapter 10, verse 45. He says that he came to give his life as a what? As a ransom for many. As a ransom. That is, as the price to pay off the debt of the guilty. That is, the price to redeem those who are enslaved. And because of our sin, the price on our heads was one of wrath and violence. And so now we are seeing wrath and violence poured out on Jesus, and it's because he is taking our place. He is sparing us for the wrath and the violence that awaited us. And so every lie that we've ever told, every time we've dishonored our parents, every time we've taken God's name in vain, every time we've failed to love God first, whenever we've maligned someone or had an unjust or, or wicked thought against a person, God's wrath against our countless sins is now beginning to be poured out on Jesus so that you and I can go free if we will repent and put our faith in Him. And so you consider the kindness of our God that he would send his son to suffer this for us. And so this is the gospel. If we come to him in faith, he will forgive us. You can count on that. If you come to him in faith saying, yes, Lord, you are right, I am wrong, please forgive me, you can count on the fact that he will. He will not only forgive us, he will consider us innocent, he will consider us righteous, and he will even adopt us into his own family. And so you think about where you were before to where God can bring you. You were guilty. You were lost. You were a rebel. You were a slave. You were dead. You were satanic. And yet God looks on you and says, I have mercy on you. And I identify with your weakness and your wrongdoing, and I want to save you. And so through the means of Jesus' blood and suffering, you can be brought into his own family. And so you're no longer alienated, as Ephesians says. You're no longer a stranger. You can be brought into the very family of God. And so to summarize, Jesus was treated as if he were guilty so that our guilt could be absolved. And you might ask the question, is there anything practical here? Is there any application that we can walk away with? And there is. First of all, I want you to remember the coming judgment, especially if you're not in Christ. Remember this. Think on this every day. Think of what he suffered. Think of the fact that he will come and judge you. And think of the fact that you have spurned his offering day after day after day after day. Think on that. That's application. Remember the sufferings of Jesus and remember your, your response. You must repent. You must put your trust in Him. You must come to Him in faith. And if you're already in Christ, I would ask you just to remember His suffering and to cherish His suffering. Jerry, Gospel, or Jerry Bridges said, preach the gospel to yourself every day. Remember the work of Christ every single day. Remember that you were a sinner deserving of his wrath. Remember that Jesus came to pay that penalty at the price of violence. And remember that he offers you his forgiveness. Remember that no one has ever demonstrated such grace and mercy and kindness towards the unworthy like us. Remember that daily and watch your life change. You're struggling with trials. You're struggling with sin. Remember the suffering of Jesus and it will shape you. Chew on his words, chew on his suffering, cherish his suffering, cherish his death, and cherish his resurrection. Remember that he was treated as if he was guilty because we were guilty. And because of his conquering, we can go free. We can be innocent. We can be righteous. We can be made into his own family. Let's take that with us. Amen.